Hey, welcome back everybody. Another exciting video here today from Blue Glow Electronics um, in our Audio Tube Amp 101 lecture series that we're doing. This is episode four and we're going to dive deep into resistance today. Um, hopefully along the way you will learn between this video and the next one we do, which will be more about the math and uh, how to calculate resistance in various types of circuits. But between these two videos, hopefully you will walk away with a couple things. One, a very pragmatic view of how resistors are used in electronics, and two, the importance of resistors in electronics. Um, you will find out that they are used all the time and so it is one of the most basic fundamental concepts you've got to get your head around if you're going to go forward and do any electronics work. So let's get busy and dive on in and uh, have some fun today. All right, let's do just a little bit of a history lesson. Back here in 1827, a guy named George Ohm, he was playing around with this little device on the right-hand side, uh, which is basically it was called a voltaic cell at that point in time. It's really an electrochemical cell. It was invented by this Italian scientist named Alessandro Volta. And George was playing around with one of these, and he realized that there was this... Uh, direct proportional relationship between the voltage across something um, and the current flowing through it. And he did a lot of uh, studying and playing around with that till he realized that, yeah, this, this is a direct proportional type of equation here that he could write. And he came up with what is called Ohm's Law, which really wasn't a law, it's more of a theory. Uh, but it, boy, is it stuck and everything in electronics is based around it these days. Um, and what it basically says is the voltage across something is equal to the current through it times the resistance uh, uh, of that substance. Okay, just a little bit of a refresher from last time. Remember, we were using this analogy, and we're going to shift away from this analogy today. But the analogy was, you know, if you had a board and two different ends of the board were at different potentials, and, and we were using the analogy of heights, um, then all of a sudden you would have a couple things. One, you would have current flowing through that conductor. And two, you would have a voltage drop across that conductor, um, or otherwise known as the difference in potential. So in other words, if this end of the, uh, the bar here was at 3, and the, this one down here was at ground, then the voltage across it was equal to 3. Um, if we, you know, then we got this current flowing through it. Then we talked about this uh, theory of, hey, if we put something sticky on the board here, then um, that would that sticky substance would offer an opposition to this flow of current, and that would we would call that resistance here. Um, and then we, you know, from uh, Ohm's law, we knew there was a relationship between all of these things, if you'll remember. Um, if you'll also remember, we said this uh, resistance to the flow of um, these balls, and let's shift away from using the balls and the boards. Um, these balls are actually electrons, and electrons are moving through a conductive material. We'll call it that at this point in time. Um, and the opposition to these electrons moving through a conductive material we're going to call resistance. We measure this resistance in a figure called ohms, which was named after George Ohm. And here we have the Greek symbol omega, which is a shorter way of writing ohms. Um, if you'll remember from that, we go right back into George's uh, law. We talked a little bit about, hey, you know, there was this proportional relationship between all of these. And what Ohm's law said was, hey, if you have one volt of electricity, and you have one amp of current flowing through this conductor, then there must be one ohm of resistance here. And you can, as you can remember, we did some algebra in, in the first class. Um, you could change this equation around by uh, moving things to the other side of the equation. So we also learned that, hey, um, current is equal to voltage divided by resistance, and resistance was equal to voltage divided by current here. Um, if you can play, if you can learn this math, um, you're home free and 90% of electronics are better. 
Okay, this is where we're going to start making the shift away from this uh, analogy of height that we've been using to describe things. Remember we were raising one end of the board up and it would cause the uh, the balls to flow down it because there was a difference in height on that board. And um, so we're going to shift away from using the analogy of height at this point. And you're just going to have to trust that there's a difference. When we talk about difference in potential, it's really a, the difference in the electrical potential on the end, you know, across the device. Um, and when we're talking about current flowing, you know, kind of across that board, well, it really doesn't flow across that board. You can see here it flows through the conductor. Um, and those things we were calling balls are really not balls, they are electrons. So um, anything that allows the electrons to flow through it, we can call a conductor. Now, not all substances um, allow electrons to flow through them. And um, when they don't allow electrons to flow through them, instead of a conductor, we typically call them an insulator. But we'll learn more about insulators later. So just get your head around anything you could, uh, you know, take two ends of a battery and connect up to, and electrons would flow through it, that would be a conductor. And so there's a spectrum of uh, substances, I would say, that are conductors. And on one end of the spectrum, they have very little resistance. In other words, a really good conductor, perfect conductor. Um, allows the maximum amount of current flow. And why is that? Because there's little resistance to slow down the current flow. And because there is little resistance and you have maximum current flow, there's not a lot of voltage dropped across that conductor. Um, if you remember, V is equal to I times R, right? Well, if, if, if I is flowing, but resistance, R, is very, very, very small, then you have very little V um, to voltage drop. On the other end of the spectrum of conductors, you have things that are very resistive. They, uh, they really don't like to let current flow through them at all. Um, these electrons meet a lot of um, resistance <laughs> hi, hi. Um, as they go through that. And the, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the minimum amount of current flows. And because, remember, V is equal to I times R, well, if R is very, very big, V is going to be big, which means there's going to be a good amount of voltage dropped across that device. Um, so we will talk about today a little bit of devices that go from little to no resistance all the way up here to a whole lot of resistance, if that makes sense. Okay, a couple simple things to get your head around. First, at the top half of the page here, anything that allows current to flow through it, in other words, electrons to actually move through it, we're going to call that a conductor. Okay, um, the more current that can flow through it, in other words, the easier the electrons can flow. Remember, we talked last time the less resistive it is, the more resistance that those electrons run into. Uh, the harder they have to fight to get through that conductor, the more resistive it is, okay? And uh, there's a principle here that basically says, hey, if you apply a constant voltage across something, uh, in this case, let's just say we applied it across uh, one end of this to the other. Maybe we hooked up a 1.5 volt battery from one end to the other here. And if this was a resistor, what we're basically saying is with a constant voltage, um, resistance is inversely proportional to the current. And, and what that really means is if you doubled the amount of resistance here, um, then it would be harder for current to flow through, and thus the current goes in half. So these things are kind of proportional to other, each other, but inversely. In other words, as the resistance goes up, the current goes down, and they're directly proportional. Uh, in other words, you double one, you half the other the same. If you half the amount of resistance in a, a uh, resistor, then you would double the current flow. And if you'll notice here, I'm using the word resistor and conductor kind of interchangeably, and that's because a resistor is a conductor. Um, it's just one, it's a conductor that doesn't let electrons move completely freely. 
In other words, it has some resistance to it. And when you take a conductor and intentionally give it an amount of resistance to it, then what you have produced intentionally is a resistor. Okay. Another concept you need to get your head around with a resistor is the fact that a resistor is designed to basically slow down electron flow, right? Well, when you slow down electron flow, you're doing that because these res these electrons are kind of they they meet friction or resistance going through this conductor. Well, that friction or resistance is energy that gets dissipated and and the way it gets dissipated is as heat. So, basically, a resistor is a device designed to slow down current and um, in that process produce heat. So in other words, um, convert energy into heat. Um, and thus, um, when you go to buy a resistor, there's a couple different, there's really three different uh, primary attributes to which you would be looking for. The first attribute would be its resistance value. And we already know that's measured in ohms. So you might go buy a 100 ohm resistor, you might go buy a 1000 ohm resistor. Remember we talked about mega ohm resistors, which might be a million ohms. Um, but it would have a set resistance value. Um, the second attribute would be how much power can it dissipate. And we measure that in watts. Um, and you'll learn more about that later. But in other words, um, this thing will have a, a value on it. And it may say, hey, this is a one watt resistor. In other words, that resistor could dissipate one watt of heat without burning up. Um, or maybe it's a 10 watt resistor, or maybe it's a quarter watt resistor. In other words, one fourth of a watt um, resistor. Um, so basically resistors have a power rating measured in watts, the, which is really the maximum power, i.e. heat that they can dissipate without burning up. So when you're trying to figure out the size of and type of resistor to buy, first thing you got to figure out is the resistance. Second thing you got to figure out is how much power this thing's going to dissipate. Um, and by, by a value larger than that. Um, the last attribute that is tied with a uh, resistor here is called tolerance. So in other words, how close is the value of this resistor to what it was advertised? Let's well, say you went down to the little electronics store, which by the way don't exist anymore. You have to order these things online. Um, and you ordered a 100 ohm resistor. And when it showed up, you got it home and you measured it with your trusty ohm meter, and it said it was 99 ohms. It wasn't 100. And you were upset because of that, because if you'd have went to the store and bought a pound of hamburger and got it home and it didn't weigh a pound, you'd have been angry and taken it back to the store and say, hey, I didn't get what I paid for here. Well, um, basically these tolerance values are what the manufacturers are advertising to you to tell you that this thing may not be exactly what the package says. So in other words, if you bought a resistor and it was advertised with a 10% tolerance and you were buying a 100 ohm resistor, that would mean that it could vary in up to 10% either side of 100. So in other words, it could be a 90 ohm resistor, it could be a 110 ohm resistor, and you'd have to be okay with it because you bought a resistor with a tolerance of 10%. Well, let's say you didn't want that. You needed a resistor that's right at 100. Well, you might need to buy a resistor with a tolerance of, let's say, 1%. If you did that, it would be somewhere between, it would be guaranteed to be between 99 ohms and 101 ohms. In other words, 1% of 100, either direction of the stated value. Um, so you might ask the question, well, why wouldn't you just buy a 1% resistor all the time? Well, they cost much more than a 5 or 10 or 20% tolerance resistor would cost. So if you're building a circuit and the tolerance value doesn't have to be exactly there, don't have to be spot on, you might want to save the money and buy a 5 or 10% tolerance resistor. I promise we're almost done here with the physics aspect of this, but there's a, another principle kind of got to get your head around here, uh, and it'll help you with understanding resistors and whatnot, is that um, for a given um, resistor or conductor, um, the amount of resistance here, 
if you can follow this formula along, is equal to, if you notice here we use this little symbol, looks like a P, where that is the resistivity of the material. So uh, you just have to know that some materials have more resistivity than others. Uh, if you remember that little spectrum we drew earlier where um, one end was a perfect conductor, lets lots of lots of electrons flow through with no resistance. On the other end was lots of resistance and uh, and, and opposed the electron flow intensely. So uh, the more resistivity you have, the more you're opposing the electron flow. So what this basically says is resistance is equal to the resistivity of the material times the length of the material. So basically what that says is the longer the resistor, the longer the conductor, the longer whatever it is, um, the more resistance it will have to it. And I'll show you some good examples in a minute. I'll help you understand this a little bit. Um, and But that gets divided by, or negated by, the cross-sectional area. So I was having a hard time drawing cross-sectional area here with PowerPoint. So I found this picture on the web. But uh, basically what it shows here is the more... Um, the more surface area here that the conductor has, in other words, the bigger round or bigger square that it is, um, the less, the least, the less resistance it has, if that makes sense. So length of something increases the amount of resistance, which makes sense. If you were driving a car through mud, the, uh, the longer you had to drive through it, the more resistance you would oppose. Um, but hey, if this, uh, if this road was wider, uh, might be easier to drive through. Um, probably not a great analogy, but uh, we'll, we'll roll with it. We could use a water analogy. The bigger a river was, the more water could easily flow through it. Um, might be another way of saying that. Um, in other words, as the length of a conductor increases, so does the resistance. As the cross-section area gets bigger, the resistance goes down. Um, as the resistivity of a material in a conductor goes up, so does the resistance. And I thought I'd show you this little symbol down here. That is the schematic symbol. So when we start working with schematics a lot, that is what a resistor looks like on a schematic symbol, as a schematic symbol. Okay. So remember earlier I said, you know, a conductor is what lets electron, you know, a substance that lets electrons flow through it. And the more opposition it has, the more resistive it is. Well, um, one thing that can have resistance to it, and it does, is just a common wire. Um, if you if you just uh, go buy a spool of wire at Lowe's or uh, one of the home improvement stores, you would find out that that wire actually has resistance to it because it's not a perfect conductor. Um, so this is uh, just a table that shows some common copper wire, right? That comes in different sizes, and uh, you know if you I don't know if you remember or have ever learned that uh, copper wire is sold in gauges. And it kind of ranges like from maybe 24 gauge here to 10 gauge. It could go all the way down to four or two gauge wire. But the larger the, the smaller the gauge, the larger the wire. In other words, 24 gauge wire is smaller than, uh, than a 10 gauge wire. And you can see that here in this uh, chart. You know, a 24 gauge wire is 0 0.02 inches in diameter, whereas a 10 gauge wire is 0.1 inch in diameter. Um, but if you notice here, um, the resistance in a thousand feet of wire. So let's just say you had a thousand, you went down to your home improvement store, bought a spool of a thousand feet of wire, stretched it out across your backyard, and connected a uh, ohm meter across that. In, in other words, a device designed to measure resistance. Connected to one end, connected to the other end. If it was 24 gauge wire, in other words, small wire, um, you would have 25.67 ohms of resistance from one end of that wire to the other. However, if you had a bigger wire here, and you bought a thousand feet of it, and you connected um, wire on one end and wire on the other, you would have less than one ohm of resistance. So going back to the previous example, um, this surface area here, remember, negates the amount of resistance. In other words, the larger this thing is around, the less resistance it's going to have. Um, so you can see how this plays out real well, real in real world. So let's just say you were buying speaker wire for your speakers. Well, this is why bigger wire, in other words, lower gauge wire, would 
get more of your signal out of your amplifier to your speakers than a smaller wire would because the smaller wire some of your signal would get eaten up in the wire um, basically um, as a voltage drop and dissipated as heat out of the wire um, because uh, it was smaller wire with more resistance um, so note the smaller the wire the more resistance it has the longer the wire the more resistance it has so um, you know distance here is what is causing the increase in uh, resistance if if you had 2,000 feet here of wire well then what you have to say is 25.67 times 2 you'd have you would have 50 a little over 51 ohms of resistance in 2,000 feet if you had 3,000 feet you would have 75 ohms of resistance or so whereas down here if you had 3,000 feet of this wire you would only have 3 ohms of resistance so that's why power wires feeding your house um, are bigger than let's say little bitty wires inside of uh, maybe your iPhone charging cable or something because uh, they don't have to carry as much power and for and for near the distance that you might the power lines out on the road feeding power to your house and here's a real world example of that that uh, I actually learned when I was in electrical engineering school back in the day um, so our teacher told us this story about how um, he knew somebody that worked for a company that repaired basically uh, yard equipment, lawnmowers, um, chainsaws, weed eaters, things of that nature. And they kept having somebody bring in their weed eater and it was uh, burned up and not working. And they, you know, being a good, the good company they were, they gave them another one because they bought it there. They replaced it. And a week later, they brought another one in, and it was burnt up. And so they, they said, well, maybe they got two bad ones, so they gave them another one. And a week later, they brought the third burnt one up uh, back into the store. And uh, finally, they started asking some questions. And, and if, you'll, if you ever read the specs on a weed eater, um, it'll basically say it's got a motor in here, and it's, it, it's rated in terms of power, so it's like a half horsepower uh, engine. And it'll, if you read the box, it'll tell you that you can run a drop cord to this uh, thing to trim your lawn with up to 100 feet. And what, this, what they found out was this guy was putting three uh, drop cords together, in other words, 300 feet, um, feeding his weed eater when he was trying to trim his ditch going down the side of his yard. Um, and so go back to the previous page. The longer the wire... The more resistance, thus the, the more resistance you have, the more voltage drop you have. And a motor like this attempts to produce a given amount of power. In other words, uh, you know, a quarter horsepower or a half horsepower of um, given power. And we'll talk more maybe what a horsepower is later. It's not something you really use as it relates to, uh, to audio amplifiers. But uh, just know it's another measure of uh, power, another way to represent it. Um, so if, if, our, if you remember back to episode one, power is equal to voltage times current. So if the voltage goes down because you've got a voltage drop across these three long drop cords and you're going to maintain P as a constant, the power is going to stay the same. Then what must happen if V goes down for P to stay the same? I must go up, right? As I goes up, the current in it, um, basically, ultimately what happens was it was burning up the wires inside of this motor because they couldn't handle that amount of current. Um, the other thing that could have happened is, you know, it could have tripped a breaker, but in this case it wasn't. It was uh, burning up the motor windings. So just a practical example of how a bunch of wires you're using to uh, feed something. Maybe that's Christmas tree lights out in your yard or... Or maybe that's a weed eater, or maybe it's uh, you know a, a pump or something you've got outside. If you hook a couple drop cords together, you're creating a good amount of resistance. So be aware of the voltage that's getting to that device at the end of the day is a lot less than you're anticipating it being. Let's talk about some resistivity of some common materials used in electronics. So first off, silver. Um, its resistivity is very low. Um, makes it a great conductor. It's probably the best conductor you could use in electronics these days that is um, 
available from a cost uh, standpoint. I mean, it's not cheap to use silver wire, but um, it's probably the best material available out there that is uh, not astronomical in price, in other words. Um, below that, you know, not far off in its resistivity value, uh, just a little has just a little more resistivity is copper, and that's why you see copper used so much. It doesn't cost nearly what silver does, but uh, it still has a really good uh, low resistivity. Um, believe it or not, gold has more resistance to it than copper. So you may wonder, why do you see so much gold used in uh, electronics? You see gold-plated connectors and whatnot. Well, it has nothing to do with its resistivity. It has to do with the fact that gold is a really good material for um, its resistance to corrosion. In other words, it, uh, it stays pure and it doesn't get uh, corroded. It doesn't build up oxidation on it. So that's why gold is used a lot. It has nothing to do with um, its resistivity. You know, aluminum uh, starting to build up a good bit of resistance as you go on up you start to get here like tungsten has a pretty good bit of resistance to it. Well, guess what? Tungsten is actually used in light bulbs um, as the filament. So when you, uh, when you hook power to a light bulb, it may have a tungsten filament inside and the resistance inside of it, and remember it converts energy to heat, right? And uh, dissipates it. Well, tungsten is one of those materials that's really special in that it dissipates its heat in the form of light, um, so which which works out really well to produce light bulbs. So, as you go on down the line, you know platinum's not a great conductor, and neither is mercury or or uh, chrome. In other words, um, you know you kind of get into this other space. We'll talk later about semiconductors, but uh, um, as you can see, they're not great conductors either. Um, and then you get all the way on the other end of the spectrum down here. If you notice, this is kind of a excellent conductor on one end, all the way to where, hey, it doesn't conduct at all. Um, and then it gets called an insulator because it doesn't conduct. Um, it, it insulates things from conducting. So glass, rubber, other things become insulators. So uh, hopefully this makes sense to you. Let's talk about some uh, practical resistors here that I use all the time. So this little kit, I ordered these off of Amazon. If you'll notice, half watt, so that's the power they can handle. There's 86 different values in here, 860 pieces, so 10 of each value. If you'll notice, they are 1% metal film resistors. So whatever value they say, they'll be within 1%. And in this box, it goes all the way up to 10 mega ohms. And the thing I like about these, um, you know, they're kind of, kind of, um, Put in order here. So if I need a 33 ohm resistor, I pull out the little pack right here, and there's my 33 ohm resistor. If I need a 1K resistor, you know, I about pull out my little pack and I use one, get a 1K resistor. Um, really easy to keep them organized, and you can see here with the 1Ks, I've used them all up, so I bought some more and put them in these packs. But uh, makes it really easy when you're hunting for something to uh, to chase it down when it's in a box like this. Um, here, got a whole bag of. Uh, I just pulled these out of a bin I keep, but these are a 4.7 ohm quarter watt carbon resistor, so those might be great in an audio signal path for sound. Um, you know, we showed some uh, power resistors earlier that wire around. There's an example of one. There's an example of one. Here's an example of one. Um, right here, 150 ohm 5 watt. Those are the little resistors I was using in that uh, 232 amplifier as the uh, bias resistors. Um, if you'll notice here, um, got a uh, 25 watt, 25K or 25,000 ohm resistor, 1% little power resistor here. And if you notice, this thing's inside of a heat sink and it's designed to be mounted to a chassis. That's to help it dissipate the heat we talked about earlier. Another example of what a, uh, an old power resistor looks like, that was a seven or 2,500 ohm resistor. Then we get into, remember, potentiometers here. Uh, remember, connect one side to the other. Um, you turn this little knob here and vary the resistance as you do it. This is what gets used all the time in, um, in uh, stereos for uh, volume controls or whatnot. But this is a 1,000 ohm resistor right here, made by Ohmite. This is a little higher quality resistor. It's actually a uh, Western Electric resistor here. It's 100K and, uh, and it's, a, it's a precision resistor. In, in other words, high tolerance designed to be very, very precise. 
Um, this is another example of a precision resistor. This is one that takes more than one turn um, to get all the way to the other end. This is a thousand ohm resistor. Sometimes I use these in, uh, in volume pots. And this is, you remember this picture? Uh, great big power um, resistor. Um, can handle a lot of power. In other words, 25 watts. It's a 1000 ohm resistor here you can see. Um, so very handy for use. Uh, these, these type here, they get used in audio amplifiers a lot. In a single-ended amplifier for the balance hum pot. Uh, that's, why I, that's why I've got some of these. Um, if you jump up here, this is a that's got 222 um, C that I'm working on. I still haven't gotten around to finishing up these videos, but if you look inside of it, you've got a resistor here, resistor here, resistor here, 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 here. And this thing is just full of resistors as you look around. These are all the older carbon composite resistors, as you can see. But you can see it's just full of them everywhere. And then guess what? You recognize what this is? This and a this is the same thing. This just happens to have an opening on the back so that you can uh, adjust it. Um, it's a potentiometer. This potentiometer and this potentiometer are how you adjust the bias of these four output tubes in this um, Scott 222C amplifier. If you'll notice here on the front side, let's check this out. We've got a potentiometer here, we've got a potentiometer here, potentiometer here, otherwise known as variable resistor, and then we've got another set of ganged ones right here too. And there's even more down inside. Let's go look on the other side of this thing. All right, well, on the other side, guess what? Guess what? <laughs> We've got our volume knob down here. We've got our balance knob here. Um, we've got our gain. We've got our treble. All these things are hooked up. Um, here, as you can see, I'm adjusting the resistance. That's all I'm doing, varying resistance with these potentiometers. So, as you can see, about half the components inside of an amplifier or resistors. So understanding resistance is extremely important. Look at this. Great big power resistors here. Um, 75 ohm, 10 watt, 10% 10 resistors. A um, couple of them here. There's actually one, two, three big ones here in a row. And you've also got a fairly large uh, resistor here on this capacitor that's used to bleed off the capacitor when you turn the power off. Uh, similarly here and here and um, we'll talk more about those later as we get into this uh, into different amplifiers and whatnot but I just need you to know why these resistors are so dang important um, it's because amplifiers are full of them one last tool that we use when it comes to resistance because you noticed um, a lot of the big power resistors I was showing you they had the values stamped on them the little resistors, you can't really stamp um, you know, the value on that thing. So a long time ago, they came up with a color code, and it's pretty universal, used across the globe. Um, it's basically an IEEE standard. Um, it's called the resistor color code chart. And basically, you got this little chart down here on the bottom. And what you do is you pick up the resistor, and typically it'll have a couple colors on one end of the resistor. And then you'll have another color, like the fourth one, way down at the other end. Or there'll be at least a good little space in between the three and the fourth one. Um, or sometimes there's not a space, but the, the last color, the colors used here at the end are not the colors used here. So you can figure it out. But, but you kind of start here, like this first color here on this uh, four band resistor, it's green. So you kind of come down and you say, okay, green is, stands for five. Okay, and then the second band here, blue stands for, we say blue here, stands for six. Um, and in this case, since it's only got four colors, four bands, the third band stands for the multiplier. So in this case, it's yellow. So we've got five, six, yellow then is 10K ohms. So 56 times 10K is equal to 560 kilo ohms. If you'll notice right here, 560 kilo ohms. Then you come to this last one here. If you'll notice, you follow it down, it tells you what the tolerance is. Well, this one happens to be silver, and silver says here it is 10% tolerance. So this is a 560k ohm resistor with 10% tolerance. 
There's also more modern, newer resistors these days have more than four color stripes on them. They'll have five. Um, typically, you find those when you get into higher tolerance resistors. So in this one, let's see, the first one was a two, right? This next color is a orange color, which stands for three. The next one here is purple, but because this one has five bands instead of four, this third color here on a five band resistor is actually another um, increment. So we had two, three, now we have purple, which is seven, right? And then the fourth one here becomes your multiplier. Um, black is times one. So we had two, three, seven times one, 237 ohm resistor. This last color here is brown. If you come over here and look at the brown in the chart, it says it's a plus or minus 1% tolerance resistor. So I will tell you that it is helpful for you to memorize this color chart. And really all you need to memorize about it is kind of the, the black stands for zero, brown, reds two, orange three, yellow four, green five, blue six, seven violet and gray eight, white nine. And that's really what you got to remember is this little section right here. Because um, then you can look at something really quickly and if it's got yellow, and it's got violet, you'll know, hey, that's a 47. You can look at the third band then usually and know the multiplier and say, oh, that's a 3700 ohm resistor or 4700 ohm resistor. So um, if not, these things are easy enough to find on the Internet. Print you off one, stick it on your uh, workbench and uh, work with it. Long Over the years, you'll just learn this thing and you won't even have to use this chart much. Uh, let's dive on in and uh, take a look at a uh, schematic, something a little more practical. Okay, we're going to close this one out just uh, with a schematic here. This is a schematic of that Scott 222C. And uh, if you'll just notice here, check out all the resistors in this thing. And you got one there, there. Oh, check this out. Um, got a variable one there. Got one here, here. Another variable one here. One here, here. And these things are everywhere. So look, there's the balance pot. BAL, and that's a variable resistor. But I could keep drawing for 15 minutes here. <laughs> Circle. So understanding resistance, I just want you to understand why it's so important. Half, if not more than of that, of the values, I mean, uh, components in an amplifier resistor. So understanding them like the back of your hand, what they do, why they do it, how they work, it's very important. So stay tuned for the next episode. We're going to get into um, how you do some math and uh, figure out resistance in what I would call a circuit. So uh, maybe this whole section here I would call a circuit, or maybe this section here I would call a circuit. How do you calculate resistance values and what they should be and what they are and what they total and whatnot? We're going to learn all that in the next section. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Uh, stay tuned. I'll keep this series going. I'm trying to do at least one video a week. Maybe I can squeeze in a second every once in a while. But work has me uh, pretty busy lately and doing a lot of traveling. So uh, we'll fit this in when I can. Uh, hope you have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you again soon.